For those of you who were here last week, we started a series about loneliness. And it's called Four Types of Lonely. And we are recapping, <clears throat> we're going to recap real quick last week. So for those who weren't here, part one had to do with loneliness with God and loneliness with family. And we talked about how last week loneliness is like a lake that is very hard and difficult to drain. And how sometimes we go to other things to try to drain this lake of loneliness and it kind of backfires because we start abusing substances. We start doing things that we shouldn't do. We start sleeping around. We start doing things and we're just being real. Things start happening, right? We try to drain the lake, but the lake doesn't drain. It just gets worse and it gets heavier. And while we're struggling with this, God has a solution for each type of loneliness. Now, for those who missed last week, the four types of loneliness we're talking about are one, loneliness with God, two, loneliness with family, three, loneliness in friendships, and four, loneliness romantically. So today, we're going to hit number three and four, and we're going to try to cram it into tonight. But if we can't, we'll allot some time next week for it. So don't worry, we're going to hit every single topic. So tonight is about friends and romance. So I'd like to start by saying this. Our generation is the most connected generation on the planet to date. Do you guys agree? You guys think we're pretty connected? Yes and no. Yes and no. And I'm glad you said that. Because although we have the most access to one another, it seems many times that our access to each other is so superficial. And it seems so difficult to connect with people in a genuine way, on a deeper level. And Social media, thank God for it, because we can connect with people we never would be able to before. That could be good, it could be bad. But here's the thing. Even though we're connecting on social media, a lot of times we have those friends, for example, where we don't talk to them at all during the year, nothing. And then their birthday notification pops up. We're like, oh, happy birthday, like we know you. Like we've been with you this whole time and we're ready to celebrate you, just for this one moment, because we don't want to feel bad, right? So it's like, happy birthday, man, or happy birthday, whatever. And it's so amazing that we're that connected and we can have those type of deep relationships, yet so many of them are superficial. And so, like Micah said, we're the most connected and disconnected generation on the planet today. And it seems like we've lost the art of friendship. It seems like we've lost what it means to value somebody, to cherish somebody, to really go out of our way for somebody, to really love with all of our heart, and we'll just throw money at it and be like, yeah, let's go for coffee, let's go for food, whatever, whatever. And we try to use people to fill our loneliness, but we don't really value them. And so other times we do value them and we do those things. And that's totally fine. But it's so profound if you would just take a moment to think about your friendships and the ones that you actually have genuine friendship with versus the ones that you kind of know but rarely talk to and would want to spend your time with. Okay? So, I don't know about you, but I mean, I follow some people where I like their content, but I don't know them. I'll be like, wow, those are some cool shoes, or that's a, that's a nice shirt, or I like the way you preach, I like the way this, or whatever. But I don't know you. You don't know me. We've never had, <laughs> we've never had a relationship. And so, with friendships, something to think about is that quality will always be greater than quantity. I would rather have one person that actually has my back in my life than a thousand that say they do and when the time comes for them to have my back, actually don't. Because the one person is far more effective in my life and people expect the same thing. People would rather have you in their life to be that one friend that's more effective than the thousand that say they'll be there. Will you be there when they need help? So let's start with our first scripture. Go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes 4, and we're going to start from 8 through 12. Some of you don't even know how to spell Ecclesiastes. It's okay. Me neither, sometimes. But it's after Proverbs. So it goes Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And again, it's chapter 4. We're going to start verse 8 through 12. All right. <clears throat> I'm reading out of the King James, and it says, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yeah, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor. 
neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath none another to help him. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold, threefold cord is not quickly broken. So let's break this down for a second. Verse 8 talks about having anything you could want. You have riches. You have wonderful things. You might have a degree. You might have a nice car. You might have a nice house. You might have all these things. But if there isn't someone to share it with, it feels so empty. It feels so lonely. And it's talking about how this person doesn't have a brother or he doesn't have a son to share this with, meaning he doesn't have the family. So that kind of ties into the loneliness we talked about last week. But it's also saying he has no one to share this with because maybe he's not even thinking of his friends. Maybe he's lonely and he doesn't have friends because he doesn't even trust his friends with riches. Maybe he doesn't value his friends with his riches. Some people hoard so much, they hoard people out of their life. And some people give so much that they give people into their life. And it's so profound because it's healthy to have a balance. You shouldn't give above your means. But we should use what God has given us to bless one another. To have good friendships. Whether that's your time, whether that's your money, whether those are your resources. I was on the phone with Levi the other day. Here's the plug, fam. Uh, I was on the phone with Levi the other day and he's like, I cut hair. And Kevin and I are both like, what? The dude cuts hair? Oh my gosh, we got to get with Levi because we want to bless Levi. If he has a talent that can bless us, then we want to bless him too. That's the plug. If you guys want to talk to Levi, he's in the back after service. <laughs> he didn't sign up for this, by the way. But I figured I'd call on someone else besides Micah and Kevin this week. So I love you guys. But with that being said, friends can make jokes like this. Friends can talk to one another like this because we value one another, right? I want to spend my time with you guys. I want to spend on you guys because you're valuable to me. Because you mean something to me. What's the point? Let's say tomorrow God blessed us with a million dollars. Someone made a million dollar donation. If anyone's watching, please feel free. Uh, <laughs> if someone dropped a million dollars on this church tomorrow, I promise you God is my witness. It would not go to my bank account. It would go to this church. It would go to a building. It would go to the needs of this church. Someone couldn't pay their bills, we'd pay it for you. If somebody needed help, we'd help you. We'd do more with what we've been given. We would spend the riches on what God desires because you'll hear more scripture about friendship. I don't want to go too deep right now, but we'll get there. But friends spend on friends. And this person who's working and laboring and having all this vanity for himself, he doesn't have that joy because there's no one to share it with. See, no one wants to win alone. Everyone wants to celebrate with somebody. Imagine you celebrate the best day of your life and there's no one to talk to you. There's no one to celebrate with you. There's no one to love you, even through the celebration. It's not always about hard times. It's about good times. And then verse 9, it goes on and it says, <clears throat> Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Before we jump into this, some of you might be saying, Man, I really want to give, but I don't have something to give. Let me tell you something. Every time you give somebody a ride, you're giving. Every time, excuse me, every time you take someone out to coffee, you're giving. Every time you're spending your time being an ear for somebody to talk to, you're, you're giving. Money is the least of the riches of this world. Money's the least. God has given us so much more than money to give. Time, for me, is the most valuable thing. If someone spends their time with me, that means the world to me. And so never look at yourself and be like, Lord, I don't have, but I want to. No, say thank you for what I do have and thank you for what I get to give. Because God has given each man a measure of faith, but he's also given each man a measure of gifts, talents, whatever it is, so that we can benefit one another for the glory of God. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. 
let me explain this to you, okay? This is amazing to me. If you guys saw this room before service began, you would have probably freaked out. And Kevin and I came in here, and thank God there was two of us. Let me just put it like that. We had a way better reward for our labor because I would have still been taking things out if Kevin was not here. Okay, it's so important to understand that two are better than one. We can hold each other accountable. We can do more together. There should never be a one-man show unless there has to be. That's why Micah's up here doing announcements. That's why Kevin is here helping with setup and teardown. That's why some of you, you're on Zoom and you're on Facebook. You're writing on the board. You're taking pictures. You're helping with uh, teardown. You're doing service coordinating. Thank you to everyone who pitches in. Thank you for everyone who gives to the Lord in this house. You are pitching in. You are building the house. This is an example of two or more are, are better than one. We have a greater reward for our labor. Verse 10, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. He has not another to help him when he falls. You know, a lot of times people don't see this, so I want to make something very obvious to me, clear, because it might not be obvious to you. But you might be praying either in your heart or in your mind or actually with words saying, God, help me. And sometimes you might not know what you need help with. You just know that something is wrong and you need help. And think of the times where God sent somebody. That person randomly called you. Hey, Marina, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. No, really, how are you? Life sucks right now. That's how I am. Think of the people that God sent to you. Because this is the example of friendship. This is the example of when someone falls, I can pick them up. And to be even more practical, if I'm, fall, if I'm falling on the ground and I'm injured, I need someone to pick me up. I need someone to help me up if I can't get up on my own. And so how could I do that if my friend was not there? And you see, community, friendship is so important. So when we're feeling lonely, it's important to understand that God has provided help, but often we don't realize who He sent to help us. Often we don't realize the friends that God chose to send us. Sometimes we want better friends or we want the friend that's convenient. And God's like, nope, this season you hang out with them. But I don't want to, God, but you need to for your sake and theirs because you're helping one another and I'm using this to accomplish my purpose. And a lot of times we don't understand what God is doing. Verse 11, and if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? Now, this is not talking about sexual stuff. This is literally saying, when you're cold, how can you warm yourself up? It's saying, you lie down next to someone because they didn't have heaters back in the day. They literally had to lie with someone. And if you want an example of this in Scripture, you could read about King David when he was old. His body was weak and he was cold. And they literally sent a young woman to just cuddle with David to keep him warm. Because he would have died of cold. But they kept warm. And so it's literally talking about, how can you do that on your own? You can't. There are certain things that God blesses in the relationship of friendship. There are certain things that God blesses in relationship with friendship. Verse 12, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. This is so important because people may not understand this, but if somebody's attacking you, let's say someone attacked me, and all the guys and the girls of this church were all out. They would be way more scared to jump me if all of you were with me. Okay? They'd be like, there's a whole squad of people. We don't know. The girls might be crazy. The guys might be like Kung Fu masters. Like, we don't know. Okay? But I would be more terrified to attack somebody that was in a group of people versus one person. He's a lot easier to pick off. And the Bible's saying, when you roll with your friends, it says, if somebody comes against you, you have support to overcome that. And sometimes it's not a physical battle. Sometimes it's spiritual and we need to pray for one another. We need a breakthrough. Sometimes it's an emotional or a mental battle and we need somebody to talk into it. The devil's coming against us. Who's covering you? And who are you covering in prayer? I don't know if you've seen the movie 300, but if you have, there's this amazing scene in it. And Gerard Butler, who's playing King Leonidas, okay, this guy... He's explaining 
to a man who wants to join his army who can't because of a disability, he's explaining to him what a phalanx is. And what this is, is he's talking about a shield that covers from thigh to neck. And he makes that very clear. That's why I remember. He's like, thigh to neck. Okay? <laughs> and he's like, if, you tease, if you can't do this, then you can't join the army. And he's like, why not? And he's like, because the phalanx covers every man to the left. And here's what's so profound. A lot of times we use the shield of faith for ourselves. But we don't realize that we're supposed to be praying and covering the brother or sister next to us as well. That when they're weak, they can use our shield. That when you're having a moment where your faith is not strong, you can use my shield. I'll fight for you. We just talked about how the God of angel armies fights for us. So it's saying if someone comes against you, friendship is so powerful because you can withstand the blows of the enemy better when there's two or three of you. It's so amazing because two weeks ago we talked about the names of God hidden in Psalm 23. And there was a name of God named Yahweh Ezer or Jehovah Ezer. And that literally means the Lord our helper. What we don't realize is these friends in our life matter because God is in them and He's sending them. And God can even use people who you would never think He could use. God is not limited on people. He's not short-staffed. If God sends you the weirdest of people, but you know it's of God, receive them. Don't be afraid. I want to share a personal story with you guys. And I, I think I have shared it before here, but if I, if I haven't, then I will tonight. But there was a season of great, great loneliness in my life when it came to friendships. And this was in 2019. I moved out of my house. I got a job in Westlake area. And I was actually living... Tanya, I was living with Tanya and Peter, and I was in their house, and they so graciously let me stay there for about two and a half months. And as I was there, it was so difficult to build and find community. And so I, I literally had many nights in those two and a half months where I wept before God, and I said, Lord, I have nobody here. It feels like I have nobody. I, I know I can call people on the phone. I don't want to annoy my cousins and ask them to hang out all the time. I don't know where to go or what to do besides the gym and food. So what do I do? I'm tired of watching movies on my laptop. Like, I want to do something, Lord. I want to, I want to be in community. So I prayed and prayed and prayed. And I ended up moving in next door to the church out there that I was going to. And the girl next door was actually promoted to be the director of the young adults ministry who lived next door to me. And I was like, wow, that's great. Congratulations, everything. And she goes, you should meet one of my friends named Jordan. I said, okay, let me meet this guy named Jordan. And so they had this couple minute breakout time at the church. And there's like 300 people at this young adults group. I'm thinking, wow, they have 300 people. Okay, who am I going to meet today? And this guy comes up to me. He goes, hi, I'm Jordan. I'm like, I'm Benjamin. He's like, no way. I'm like, no way. And then that guy plugged me in to a small group, and the small group had like 40 people in it. And then from there, friendships grew and community came. But I didn't have my loneliness in friends alone. I was lonely in my friendships with God. And it wasn't that I wasn't having friendships out here. It was the fact that we were so far away that it was just impossible to drive back and forth. And so God gave me community out there. And I kid you not, within about 10 months, there was probably 60 to 100 people that I know out there now. And it's incredible to see what the Lord did. But involve God. He's your helper. Involve God when you feel lonely in your friendships. Involve God because God has divine connections. God has divine friendships around the corner. Don't do loneliness alone. But I want to address a few things, and this is going to hit some of you. This is where it's going to get a little bit deeper. So if you're taking notes, feel free to take these notes. If you're just online listening, then go ahead and listen. But this is so important because sometimes the reason why we're lonely in our friendships is because of us. And we don't want to admit that. But sometimes it's our fault why we're lacking friendship. And I'm going to hit a few things, probably about eight topics tonight. And one may resonate with you. Two may resonate with you. Or none may resonate with you. But it's really important that you hear this from a standpoint of Scripture. The first point is this, <clears throat> that many of us would rather be pursued than to pursue. Many of us would rather the person hit us up. We'd rather have the person make 
the contact and be like, let's do something. And we don't hit them up. And we sit around and we're lonely and we're like, they don't even think about me. They don't talk to me. They, they completely forgot about me. And the thing is, why aren't we calling them if we want to see them that bad? It's because we feel entitled to be pursued instead of being the ones to pursue friendship. And as children of God, God has modeled for us what to do. We're sent to go win the lost, but we're also sent to serve the found. So if we're not winning the lost and we're not serving the found, then what are we doing in our friendships? If we're not doing life with the church, if we're not doing life with the people in the world to bring them to the church, to, they don't have to be in your inner circle, but bring them in. Remember where we were. Bring them into the house of the Lord. Let God sanctify. Let God cleanse. Let God restore and heal and build them up. But the issue is we have to get over ourselves. Go pursue the person that you've been wanting to pursue if you know that God's okay with it. Don't go pursue people that you know God hasn't told you to pursue as friends. Remember this, the disciples didn't call Jesus. Jesus called the disciples. That's point one. Number two, on the flip side, we often reject invitation. <laughs> on the flip side of the coin, someone's like, hey, you want to hang out today? No, I'm a little busy. You got nothing to do except binge Netflix. Okay. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Oh, just going to the gym. Okay. They're asking you for attention. They're asking you for affection. They're asking for friendship. And the gym isn't even yours. Invite them to the gym. Receive that invitation because it's an opportunity for God to move. Often we reject the invitation. And after a while, that person's going to go to someone else. Like, you know what? They might, they might even get in their mind like, oh, they're too busy for me. They're too good for me. They're too this for me. Whatever, whatever. And they will skip you and go to the next available person. And that person may be detrimental to their life. But because we were not available, they went somewhere else. And that's not to put pressure on you, but that's to ask God, Lord, should I hang out with them? God, should I make time for this person? Because sometimes God will tell you no. Sometimes God will tell you cut the time short. Sometimes God will say spend more time. Don't worry. So it's very important. Friendships are both a privilege and an opportunity that shouldn't be taken for granted. They should never be taken for granted because we don't know our lifespan. One friend could be here today and gone tomorrow. I've had friends who've committed suicide. I've had friends who died. I've had friends who moved away and it was unexpected. And some, I, I just wonder if we hung out, would the outcome be different? I don't know. And then on the flip side, I have many friendships that I've been friends with for over a decade, some two decades. And it's a blessing to know that we can have friends that long in our life. And so the third thing that I want to talk about is this is another reason why we don't have friends or we feel lonely is that we hold on to offense and unforgiveness. Oh, you did this? That's it. Cut off for the rest of your life. And some things... Look, you should forgive and move on and never be friends with that person again. You don't have to reconcile with everybody because of safety purposes, whatever the issue is. But you can't cut everybody off every time there's an issue. Sometimes offense and unforgiveness hinders us. So go ahead and turn to Colossians 3. We're going to read 12 to 14. All right, and I'm reading this one out of the NIV. It goes like this. Therefore, as God's chosen people... Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against somebody. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So the Bible gives us wonderful, wonderful blueprints for how to have excellent, long-lasting friendships. How? Bear with one another. Forgive one another. How? Being kind, being humble, being gentle. How? By understanding that we are forgiven, that we are God's chosen people, that if we don't model Christ to these people, who will? Who will? It's so powerful when you can forgive somebody. When you can stop holding a grudge, it's so powerful 
when you can go up to somebody and be like, look, you did me dirty, but I'm going to bear with you today. And sometimes they're the people who live in your own house. <laughs> sometimes not even a friend. Sometimes the people who live in your own house. You say, I love you regardless. Point number five. Or sorry, four. We don't like to be called out for sin. Because sometimes God sends friends in our life to refine us, to help us grow in Him. And we don't like them very much because they tell us the truth and they challenge us and they want us to grow. And we're not ready. We don't want to grow. We don't feel like giving up sin today. We don't feel like being challenged. We don't like how every time they come around, they have something to say about the Lord and, and God is so good. And you're like, dude, enough already. I get it. I don't. But God is sending them and you don't even realize rejecting them is rejecting Him. That every time God wants to have a conversation with you through them, your ears are closed and your heart is hardened and your eyes are closed. But if you would just receive them, you don't have to turn here, but Proverbs 27, 5 through 6, the New King James Version says, Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What does that mean? It means the people who hate you and they're not really for you, they'll flatter you. They'll flatter you for the sake of getting what they want. But a friend wants you. A friend wants the best for you, so they'll tell you the best for you. And sometimes you don't want the best for you, but they do. Some, some of you have friends that are up praying for you in the middle of the night. Some of you have friends that, that beg God for your breakthroughs. Some of you have friends that are petitioning God to just bless you in a way that you are even tired of praying for. And they're going to the throne room for you. So when God sends them, please don't reject them. Point number five, we're just not that friendly sometimes. <laughs> Some of us are just not that friendly. For those of you who have been over my house or when the church started at the house, you know that I have a dog named Chico. Now this dog, he appears to be the cutest thing on the planet. And as soon as you get close to him, he shows you his teeth. And he starts snarling and, and barking and, and wanting to attack and pounce like a lion. And you're like, dude, you're like a rabbit with some like extra height. What's wrong with you? But he's so angry all the time. And I just think if he was a human being, I would kick you out of my house so fast. Like I would call the cops so fast if you were a human being. Because every time I'm around you, it feels like you're cussing me out. Then you love me and you only want me because I feed you and take you on walks. Who are you? Okay. This little malicious but loving dog, okay, he is so funny, but a lot of times we don't realize we act like my dog. And I'm not calling you a dog, so don't go ahead and be like, the pastor called me a dog today. <laughs> I didn't call you a dog. I said we're acting like it sometimes, okay? The Bible says, Proverbs 18, 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, okay? If you have friends... You're responsible to be friendly. It's like, duh. Okay, I need to be friendly. I have friends. So a couple questions to ask yourself. Am I trustworthy? Am I reliable? Am I supportive? Do I bring correction when needed and do I receive it? Do I love well? Do I value the person in front of me? How do I show hospitality? Am I kind? Do I even smile? I mean, you guys try like, it's really difficult for you to smile, but it's okay. Just pray, God will help you. You'll be coming here looking like a Colgate smile next week, like, hey, you're the greeter, congratulations. But an example of this, and, and Micah, I'm sorry to do this, but a good example of this is Micah. I have never been to Micah's house, hung out with Micah, and, I, and I'm not saying this out of flattery, this is the truth. Kevin can vouch for me, Jared can vouch for me. I've never been to Micah's house where Micah was not kind, gentle, welcoming, hospitable. He, he makes you feel as if you're worth something. And he's the epitome in my life of this scripture that we just read in Proverbs 18, 24. He's the man who shows himself friendly. That he's supportive when you need support. He's there when you need help. Micah has never been the type of guy who you walk into his house for a minute, not even for a minute, that you feel awkward or weird or you feel like, man, I, I overstayed my welcome. In fact, Michael will fight for you to stay and you'll be like, I got to go. And he's like, do you want anything else? Is there anything else I can get you? I'm thinking, God, this man's amazing. Who is this guy? And he, 
He has that gift, and it's a, it's a spiritual thing. A lot of times we don't realize hospitality is actually a gift of the Spirit because we're so focused on the super gifts that we forget these gifts. But that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit expresses Jesus through Him. Because Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is the one who welcomes us when everyone shuns us. Jesus is the one who can relate to us and show Himself friendly when we act like my dog. And it's amazing. Number six. I'm not saying it's you, okay, or me, but I'm just saying someone's attitude sucks, okay? This is number six. It could be your friend. It may not be you, okay? But Proverbs 22, verse 24 through 25 says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Me. I was saying, don't be friends with a, with a hothead, with a hot-tempered person. How many times do you hear on the news, there was road rage and then this person got shot? How many times do we hear on the news, there was, there was some sort of rage at this bar and someone was killed? Someone was this, someone was that. Because a moment of uncontrolled anger led to that. Don't be friends with an angry person. It doesn't say don't help them. It say don't be friends with them. And that doesn't mean that every time you get angry, you're defined as an angry person. So don't let that condemn you either. But it's saying, be careful in your friendships. If you notice a trend that they're always angry, there's always, always anger, there's always something. Those are not the type of people you want to build your life with. And if you're that person, then you want to submit to Jesus as soon as possible. Because your friends, if they're really your friends, they deserve the best of you. Because Jesus deserves the best of you. And when you reflect him through your best, they'll see him clearer. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen too many people like drama. I haven't seen too many people be like, you know what, I'm going to go hang out with Phil, he's angry. Like, it just doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, I'm going to go hang out with Seth because this guy is super pissed off all the time. No one says that. People are like, you know what, man, I want to hang out with Jared, he's a funny guy, he's great, I want to be around him. I want to hang out with Emmanuel. This guy's so peaceful. He's so like loving. He's so genuine. I want to be with that guy today. I want to hang out with him. No one, no one says, I want to hang out with an angry person today. It just doesn't work. And if we're angry, then we need to ask God to help. Because there's something going on on the inside that needs to be submitted to the healing of God. And these are all different reasons why sometimes we feel lonely in friendships and may not even know. We may not even know that we're doing these things. So that's why they're being brought up in the house of the Lord and Scripture so we can check ourselves. And if it's not us and if it's our friend, then start praying that God puts the right people in your life. Because like we talked about, God builds a community. This church is a community. We're in each other's lives. We're not just here to be bumps on a log. We're here to support each other. We're here to build each other up. We're here to build the kingdom of God. We're here to relate to one another. And there's a whole world that's dying out there that's waiting for us to go after them. <clears throat> Number seven. Sometimes God is actually drawing us away from relationships that are harmful to us. And we don't realize, God, how come all my friends left? How come everybody that I started with, they're not here anymore? And sometimes God's actual answer is because they don't love you. They don't even support you. Don't be so desperate for whatever. I want to give you treasure. I want to give you friends you can cherish. I want to give you friends you can do life with. I want to give you friends that change your life and call you higher. I want to give you a good quality set of friends. I want to give you some good friends. And God's not condemning the person. God's just protecting you. It's important that we discern that. That God wants us to be a good friend to people. But do you think that God wants people not to be good friends to you. God wants us to do better together, do more together, to cover one another. And so sometimes God draws us away from friendships that are harmful. Scripture literally says, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So who's in your inner circle? Who do you have around you? Is it a bunch of yes men? Is it a bunch of people who just... You're their sin buddy. Like, let's go out. Oh, I don't want to. Come on. Let's just go out. 
and you become their chauffeur to sin. They just want to use you. They don't love you. They don't care for you. They care about them and they want you involved. And so Proverbs 13.20 also says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. <clears throat> I'm kind of laughing to myself about this scripture because I was the fool in high school. I was doing so many crazy things, but thank the Lord that we're okay. People can grow and God can change people. But survey your environment. Ask, ask yourself, who am I walking with and where are they leading me? What are we accomplishing in our friendship together? Is there peace here or is there always drama? Is there joy here or is it always heaviness? Is Jesus here or is it always anti-Jesus? What is my friendship like? It's important to ask yourself these questions. Because so many Christians become lonely for the sake of righteousness. And that's one way where we get to relate to Jesus. But be careful that that loneliness for righteousness does not become loneliness for self-righteousness. That's the fine line that we get to walk. We have to be careful. Remember that we're called to call people out of the dark and into the light. We're not called to go into the dark to become the dark and then win them to the light. We're called to go into the dark and get them out. We're supposed to save the prisoners. We're supposed to go after them and bring them to the light. If, if you guys have ever seen Lion King, if you haven't, that's your homework for the week. Go watch Lion King, the, the OG one, okay, the Disney one. There's a scene where Mufasa, who is the king of Pride Rock, he's the chief lion. He has a son named Simba. And this whole story has so many biblical parallels. But he's talking to Simba, and he's a young lion, and he's saying, look, Simba, it's like one day this whole kingdom is going to be yours. Everything the light touches. And Simba goes, all of it? He's like, all of it. You're going to be the king. He goes, whoa. And he's so fascinated with power. But then Mufasa tells Simba, he says, look, see that over there where the light is not? It's like the darkness. He's like, yeah. He's like, don't go there. That's not our kingdom. And Simba takes it upon himself. He's like, I'm going to be king so I can do what I want. And he goes to the darkness, which is an elephant graveyard where the enemies of the kingdom are. There are hyenas. There are other lions that are anti-Mufasa. And it's so biblical because there's the kingdom of darkness. And so Simba goes just to play around in there. And he gets in so much trouble that his dad literally has to come and save his life from being killed. But in the process... The enemy plans to kill his dad. And so, why am I bringing up the Lion King? Bringing it up because a lot of times we're like Simba. We say, I belong to God. I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to go hang out with my friends and we're going to do whatever and everything's going to be fine. It's great to have faith, but don't abandon wisdom in the process. They're twins. They're not identical. They're fraternal, but you need both. You need faith. You need wisdom. Both of them. Daniel didn't throw himself into the lion's den. He was thrown there and God saved him. A lot of saints in the Bible didn't throw themselves into things. They were thrown into things and God came to their rescue. Just like Mufasa to Simba. So don't throw yourself somewhere and say, God's going to save me. God's going to save me because you're putting God to the test. The Bible says don't do that. So God will reward you if you're truly being lonely for the sake of righteousness. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Number eight. It's better to be, or before eight, it's better to be alone in the will of God than to be surrounded by evil and outside of it. Now number eight. Your friends cannot go where God has called you. Sometimes we're lonely because where God has called us, we're willing to follow, but our friends are not. And they might not be called, they might not be in sin. They're just not called to be there with you. Some of you may say, my, my season has been so long and so hard and so lonely. My season has been so difficult. I feel alone. I cry out to God. I get that He's with me. I get my family supports me. But this weighs so much heavier than God being with me. Let me explain something to you. Don't reject the friends that God sent for the friends that you prefer. Because where you're going, they can't go. And if they can, a lot of times people are not willing to go. Think of it, it's not that much different. Some of you went to school and you have to put your friends on the side to get a degree. Some of you 
you had goals to accomplish and your friends could not accomplish those goals for you. You had to do it, whatever it was. And you had to set them on the side for a moment to accomplish that goal. And by the time you were done, some stuck around and some didn't. And that's okay. It's a narrow road to walk with the Lord sometimes. So I want to show you an example in Scripture where this actually happened. Uh, let's go ahead and turn to John 6, verse 53. I'm going to read through 71. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, which means truly, truly, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of disciples, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? Meaning, who can understand it? Who wants to hear this? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, which means to give life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye go also? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. There's a lot going on in this scripture, and it's way longer than what we read. So if you ever want to read John 6, it's incredible. But what's so sad and powerful here is that people are following Jesus at this point, and there are thousands following him. There are thousands. People think he only had twelve disciples. No, he had thousands of followers thousands of people who believed in him but here's the issue people followed Jesus for what he could do for them not because they loved him and believed he was the son of God so when he told them these hard things to believe they left because they're like okay cool you did a few miracles thanks for the fish the bread that was great like gourmet you're the bread of heaven great we like talking about this but we can't receive this we can't follow you where you're calling us to walk saying that you have to receive my body. You have to receive my blood. They were taking issue with that. So, so many people left Jesus that day to the point where Jesus in himself, right? Here's something that I, I honestly wonder and I don't know. But was that a moment where Jesus was grieving and maybe, possibly, had a human moment of insecurity? Looking at the twelve, knowing what the Father said, not a lack of faith, but just knowing that the disciples have a choice in looking at them and saying, are you going to leave me too? There's so much power and humanity in that sentence, are you going to leave me too? Here's what's so profound about that is, it was so bad, so many people left that Jesus had to look to the people who were with him the whole time and ask them. That's crazy. So many people will leave you for the sake of you following Christ. And you got to be okay with that. Because here's the deal. God will provide people in their place. God will not leave you empty-handed. God will not leave you when you're following Him. God will supply you with everything you need, even community. John 15, verse 12 through 13 says this. This 
is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This scripture is literally the epitome of what it means to be a friend. It, it literally is the epitome saying, if you're not willing to lay down your life for me, then we haven't even reached a level of friendship that's, that's even worthy. Jesus is talking about, he, he's making it so intense because this is literally how he modeled friendship to his disciples. He said, I'm going to go die for you now. And you love each other so much that you're willing to die for each other. That if the time comes, you're willing to give your life up for them. That's tough. That's tough. You're like, I love you, but not that much. I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some money if you need some help. I'll, I'll change your flat tire. But someone was like, hey, Benjamin, I want you to go die for someone today. I'd have to spend some serious time with God and be like, okay, Lord, like it's actually happening. I, I don't even know what that would look like. What would I tell my family? What would I tell this church? What would I tell all the people in my life? Why, why are you dying again for this person? Yeah, but he doesn't even love you that much. Yeah, but it's not about his love for me. It's my love for him. I'm willing to die for him or her. It's my love for her. It's my love for him. I'm willing to do that. How crazy would that be? And that's the kind of love that Jesus is telling us friends should have between each other. And so with that being said, it's so profound when we look at all these eight points through Scripture and we evaluate and we ask ourselves, are we those friends or do we have those friends? And if we don't, it's okay. Let's pray that God places them in our life because I'm sure there's some of them maybe in this room. I'm sure there's some friends in this room that would give their life up for somebody if it really came down to it. Just know this, that the way we treat one another is how people know that we belong to Jesus. He said, you will, they will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. So with that being said, there's so much more to talk about romantically. We're not going to be able to get to it tonight. But next week, we're going to continue about romance and what that looks like, loneliness there. Because whether you guys raise your hands or not, all of us in this room have experienced that or are going through that right now. And you need to know that God cares so much about you that He's willing to take this topic and address it and not leave it. But here's what I will say so that it can lead into next week. Romantic loneliness doesn't necessarily mean single. You can be in a relationship and feel completely alone. You could be in a relationship and feel completely lonely. And so being in a relationship doesn't make you less lonely. Sometimes it makes you more lonely. Because you want to be with somebody who's supposed to be affectionate toward you and give you attention and love you. And all it seems that they can do is look past you and not even look at you. And some of us have gone through that. Some of us are going through that. Some of us are lonely in our singleness. Whatever the reason is, I don't want to cheapen that message. So by God's grace, we'll, use, we'll do that message next week. And if you have friends that are going through it, this is a message that you want to bring them from, to. You want to bring them to this message to hear it. With that being said, if everyone, whether you're online, here, go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes. We're just going to take a moment to just to pray. If you're here or online and you heard the word of the Lord tonight, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Again, the Word of God says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a promise throughout all of Scripture that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, Jesus came not to condemn us but to save us. He came because our righteousness was filthy and it was dirty. 
And all of us have sin in our life that separated us from God. And the Father sent the Son because only God was big enough to pay the price that God demanded and was owed. So He gave His life for us. So if you know that, man, I've been walking in sin. I've been living in sin. If you know that you haven't been walking with God and maybe you love God, but you've walked away. Maybe you love God and you've never invited Him in to have a relationship. Well, tonight we're going to offer you that opportunity. If that's you, whether you're here or online, if you're in the building, go ahead and raise your hand on the count of three. If you're online, go ahead and type in, yes, that's me. Whether that's on Zoom or Facebook Live, we want to make sure that we pray with you. Ready? One, two, three. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand or type in, yes, it's me. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed because the Lord loves you. The Lord wants to work in you. We can't make ourselves clean. We can't make ourselves righteous. But Jesus can. So if anyone is saying yes to the Lord tonight, it's that simple. He did all the work. All He's saying is invite me in. Invite me in. This is an invitation you don't want to reject. So if you prayed that prayer or, or you made that decision to pray this prayer, go ahead and pray this with me. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I confess with my mouth that you are the Lord, the Son of God. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. Thank you for dying for me to forgive me of sin and reconnect me with my Father. In Jesus' name, amen.